So as a quick recap of confirming causal hypothesis in populations, we looked at the control cause to effect experiment, which essentially is kind of the gold uh, standard in doing sciencey stuff. And the idea is that you, you're wondering, what does this do? You're wondering, what is the effect of the cause? So you know the cause. And what defines a control cause to effect experiment is this. First, it's um, controlled. So the idea is that what you end up doing is you have the question you're, you're looking at, you're wondering what does this do, and you have your uh, population. And so this is your population, badly drawn, that you want to know about. And you have a uh, causal agent, and you're wondering what does it do. So to conduct the controlled cost and effect experiment, it's very similar, as I mentioned uh, in class, to doing an inductive journalization. So you pull out a sample that ideally represents your uh, target population that you want to know about, and then you split it into two groups. One group is the control group, which is ideally like your other group called the experimental group, with the difference being that the control group, you don't expose them, assuming you're the one conducting the experiment, you don't expose them to the uh, cause that you you want to, to test, to see the effect of it. And so the experimental group is exposed to the the cause, and then you observe the results and see if they're statistically significant. So the hallmarks for the control cause to effect experiment is it's controlled. So you have a control group and an experimental group, and you know the cause and you're wondering about the effect. And kind of the key distinction here is that those conducting the experiment introduce the cause. And so in terms of statistical significance, we looked at, you know, what this has to be. And then we looked at briefly the other um, method, which occurs in cases where it'd be impractical or unethical to engage in uh, an experiment, intentionally introducing a cause to see what the effect is. In those cases, one would use a non-experimental cause to effect study. And so the cause is known. The question is, what is the effect? And the pattern is very similar. So Here's a population you want to know about. Uh, the difference is, though, is that those in the experimental group are selected by either their own actions or circumstances, so you don't get to depict them, and so they're selected, uh, in a sense, for you by being exposed to the cause. You do, however, get to select your control group. You pull those out of the population, and you want to match them as closely as possible. And then you'd observe to see once you've conducted the study, what is the difference between the two groups? Is it statistically significant? And it is a uh, weaker uh, reasoning because of the possibility of bias. Again, those people or entities, you know, whatever you're, whatever you're uh, considering, whatever you're studying, they're selected not by you or the person conducting the the study, rather they're exposed to the cause in question by either their own actions or their you know, circumstances. So for example, it'd be unethical to, you know, force people or, or you know, get people to smoke uh, tobacco products because of the, the danger, that, you know, in them. Uh, but of course, there are people who willingly smoke. And so if you're doing a study of the effects of smoking, the people who smoke would be your experimental group and you match them up with similar people in your control group. And again, this would be weaker because there can be important differences between the people or other entities in your experimental group that make them differ from your control group that can affect the outcome. Now, our final method of testing in populations is the non-experimental effect to, to cause studies. And it's non-experimental, so the person conducting it or people conducting it don't expose uh, you know, the subjects uh, to a suspected cause. In fact, because it's an effect to cause study, what is known is the effect, and the question is, what is the cause? That's what is not known. And so in this case, your experimental group, and again, it may be kind of odd to call an experimental group when you are not doing an experiment, but that's kind of the terminology. So you pull pull that out, and you don't know what the um, cause is. You know what the effect is, and so your control group 
they match up with the those showing the effect and the question is what is the difference between these two groups that is likely to be the the causal factor this often occurs when you know bad things happen uh, for example when trying to determine the cause of a disease so in our next uh, pandemic uh, when people start showing you know symptoms of an illness we know the effect people are sick and the question would be what is causing that and so we would run a a effect to cause study and try to find out what is different about uh, the people showing the illness from people who don't and for example it may be that you know we're we're this is kind of gross but we're we're already, you know, we naturally have all kinds of viruses and bacteria and fungus all, you know, all through us. And so you look for something that the people who are sick, say an unknown or new virus that other people don't have. And it's obviously more complicated by than that, but that would be the basic idea. And then you make the inference, kind of a large scale uh, method of difference. You know, what is the difference between these two groups? And then you'd say that is probably the, uh, the cause. Now, there are kind of uh, important weak points with this method because the people in the experimental group, and again, even though it's a study, it's called experimental group, they may differ in some important ways from the rest of the target population. And these can influence the results. And this is why uh, having good control groups would be, be rather important. For example, if we're tracking down, say, uh, the causes of say a cancer we'd have to consider well what um what are factors that may you know be at play that are causing this cancer to use a more concrete example suppose we're looking at the causes of cancer of the mouth and we would have to look at the fact that well um so former smokers are more likely to use chewing tobacco but also more likely to get mouth cancer and so a sample of people with cancer of the mouth would tend to include more ex-smokers than general population and hence would include more tobacco chewers. So it might be concluded that chewing tobacco is the cause of this cancer, but this might possibly be mistaken because maybe it's the other tobacco product that causes it. And again, I'm not, I'm not making a claim about what really is causing, causing what. It's just an illustration of how the experimental group in this study, again, kind of weird term, uh, how they could differ from the general population. Another problem with this particular method is inherent to the method. In the other, uh, like the experiment or the cause to effect study, the cause is known, you try to find the effect. In this case, the effect is known and you're trying to backtrack and sort out the cause. And so the studies only show the probable frequency of the cause not the effect and so we really can't estimate the percentage of the target population that would be affected if everyone was exposed to the cause whereas in the case of the you know cause to effect experiments and studies we can make an estimate so to use a practical example if we're going cause to effect with a you know say a chemical and it ends up producing you know cancer at a certain rate we could kind of confidently say well if it has this effect in our our you know our in our study we can extend that to the general population so if like two percent of the people in the in the study uh develop cancer after exposure then we could say well about two percent of the population would do so but in the case of effect to cause uh, we can't do that because we're going from effect to cause and of course, there's many other practical problems. Like one example would be, of course, uh, concerns about time, because the more time there is between the you know, the effect being investigated and the suspected cause, there are so many other factors that could come into play. So if we we're looking at, for example, if someone started investigating the causes of Gulf War syndrome now and trying to backtrack to it, uh, the people who the veterans um, who have the that gulf war syndrome they've been exposed to lots of things in that time period and if you went back to say to agent orange in vietnam that would be a really long time and so it would be hard to sort out was that actually the cause because of the the time involved and people being exposed to all kinds of other 
factors, such as other contaminants and chemicals and so forth uh, that we're exposed to, uh, sadly, uh, kind of constantly. So that is the non-experimental effect to cause study. So the hallmark of this is, it's what gives it away, is that it's the effect is known, the cause is not. And so in, as a practical matter, when sorting out between these three, the giveaway for the experimental cause to affect, you know, the experiment is the way it's described. Those conducting the experiment know the cause and they're introducing it to the experimental group. In the cause to effect study, the cause is known, but those conducting the study do not introduce the cause. Those in the, you know, the experimental group were exposed by their own actions or some other you know circumstances but not by those conducting the the study in the effect of cause study the hallmark is the effect is known the cause is not and that's kind of the main giveaway but it's also a study so those exhibiting the effect uh, were not uh, exposed to the whatever the cause was by those conducting the study so those are our uh, three main ways of sorting out causation and populations. And next we'll move on to mistakes in causal reasoning. Now we'll get into the fallacies uh, in the next video, but briefly here are some reasons to reject a causal explanation, uh, be it, you know, small scale or causal uh, cases or these large scale population cases. So these would be things you looked at, like the explanation is unduly complicated, uh, the idea being, again, that the simpler is generally better. Now, this is not to say that it's impossible to have complicated explanations, because obviously you can, but kind of the test is, is it unduly complicated? Does it have, like, you know, is it compared to another explanation that also explains it? Does it have too much complication? And again, this can be difficult to, to judge. Kind of a very important standard, rather important standard is, that an explanation, a causal explanation that is not compatible with uh, known facts and theories, ones that have already been you know, well and solidly established, that's a significant negative to any explanation. Now, people, of course, will point out, well, they'll point to examples like how uh, Newtonian physics was overturned later by, say, Einsteinian physics, and Einstein's physics as being, you know, uh, being altered in some ways by new findings. And of course, if you look at the history of, say, medicine, people had beliefs about how, you know, disease worked, then along comes the germ theory, etc. And people will point to revolutions in the sciences, in, in other areas, in technology, and say, aha, you know, these can be overturned. And on one hand, yeah, the things, what was believed to be a fact or a correct theory can be overturned. But it's overturned by, you know, using, you know, actual methods of testing that are adequately supported and tested. And so, in general, the facts that are well established and theories that are well established, they have to be overturned in a way that addresses all the evidence and reasoning and experiments and so forth that back them up. And just because someone comes along with something, it doesn't mean that they're they're right. They could be right, but simply just asserting something uh, is not going to overthrow existing facts and theories. And people often uh, kind of over overdo the, the you know the exciting overturns of science because you know, if you look at like Galileo or Copernicus revolutionizing science, uh, but of course they're famous for that because it's something pretty unusual. If it was really easy to overthrow you know, well-established uh, facts and theories. And, you know, anyone could do it just by spending a few minutes on, you know, Facebook or Googling. And then, obviously, you know, there wouldn't be something that would make people famous. It would just be super easy to, to do. So, in regards to being compatible with known facts and theories, in general, yeah, that's a huge minus. Uh, keeping in mind, of course, that if someone is, in fact, doing, you know, you know careful and you know, legitimate uh, you know, research or running proper experiments with controls and so forth, there is a possibility that they could overcome, you know, overthrow the existing facts and theories, but it's generally, you know, pretty difficult. And of course, if a explanation is vague, that is say too too fuzzy, too, lacking in precision, that's bad. If it's ambiguous, has two or more possible, you know, meanings, it's not clear what's intended, 
that's bad. And of course, circular you know theories are also obviously problematic. And then of course, um, one of the gold standards of doing the science stuff is being testable. If a explanation is correct, then it's saying how the world is. And that means that it's, you know, the world is different from the way it's described in other explanations. And that is something that needs to be testable. Because if you can't test it, there is no way to know whether it's correct or incorrect without just kind of guessing. And so being able to make a prediction that can be tested is, you know, a critical part of, well, critical thinking, basic, you know, as they say, scientific uh, method. So those are our three ways of looking at causal you know, causation and populations and some, you know, uh, kind of like red flags for causal explanations. Again, in terms of being, you know, complicated, uh, maybe the complicated one is correct. Uh, maybe a person has developed the new theory that will overthrow the old theories. But again, you need you know, a significant amount of evidence for that. And of course, being vague, ambiguous, and circular, those are always bad. And being untestable, always bad as well. And next time, we'll head on to look at some causal uh, fallacies, ways one can go bad in one's reasoning when engaged in causal thinking.